On September 3rd, 1943, American Major General Walter Bedell Smith and Italian General Giuseppe Castellano signed an armistice representing the Allied powers in the Kingdom of Italy, officially ending Italy's participation with the Axis. Italy was now suddenly split between the Allied Kingdom and the Italian Social Republic, supported by Nazi Germany, and much of the Italian military collapsed almost immediately. But as the first month of the Allied Division came to a close, largely civilian forces in Naples took up arms of their own accord against Nazi elements in the city, fighting for days before the first Allied units would arrive. It is history that deserves to be remembered. By July of 1943, Italy's military position had become dire. Italian forces in Africa were defeated. The Allies had successfully landed on Sicily, bringing the war closer to Rome. The populace was becoming less and less thrilled with their leadership. In March, large-scale strikes occurred in the north, where Italian factories often had no raw materials and its people had little food thanks to Allied bombing, which increased in 1942 and 43. In response, the Grand Council of Fascism convened on the night of July 24th into July 25th, where the council passed what was essentially a vote of no confidence in Mussolini. The next day, the King of Italy replaced Mussolini with Pietro Badoglio and had Il Duce arrested. This did not change Italy's foreign policy, and demonstrations celebrating Mussolini's fall were suppressed by the Badoglio government. Sicily was captured by August 17th, and by then Italian leadership was interested in negotiating an armistice to end their part in the war. They put off the Germans by insisting they meant to remain loyal to the Axis alliance while negotiating with the Allied leadership. After the signing of the armistice on September 3rd, the deal remained secret until September 8th, when Eisenhower announced the armistice, even as Allied forces were preparing to land at Salerno and Taranto. Some had already landed at Reggio. Though the Italian leaders had hoped for a few more days before the announcement, they made their own announcement shortly after. The situation in Italy was then very much in flux. German forces had been entering the country since July in preparation for its possible surrender, but the forces in place were still surprised by news of the armistice. German sources had believed that Italy had refused stringent demands. Germany moved swiftly to capture or force compliance from Italian forces throughout the north of the country. While some would join the Nazis, most of these forces simply dissolved in the face of aggressive German soldiers and in the absence of clear commands from King Umberto or the Prime Minister. The few German forces stationed in southern Italy were rapidly withdrawn north towards the defensive Gustav Line. The landing of the 8th Army at Reggio was barely contested. The situation was more serious at Salerno, where the U.S. 5th Army was undertaking Operation Avalanche. The landings had not been supported by preliminary bombardment in the hopes of maintaining surprise. As the first troops landed, loudspeakers on the beach announced in English, Come on in and give up. We have you cornered. Though Italian forces had changed sides, Salerno was defended by Germans of Army Group C under the command of Field Marshal Albert Kesselring. Kesseling had actually barely been able to receive word from German command of the Italian surrender after his headquarters was heavily bombarded on September 8th. Hitler had been convinced by Erwin Rommel, who commanded Army Group B in northern Italy, that defense of southern Italy wasn't a priority, so Kesseling was ordered to delay the Allies and withdraw to defensive positions south of Rome. The landing at Salerno was opposed by only part of the 16th Panzer Division, and Kesseling was not confident he could oppose the landing while simultaneously withdrawing and securing Rome. But Kesselring proved tougher than that and nearly recaptured the beaches and concerted counterattacks in the ensuing days. After a week of vicious fighting and thousands of casualties, the Allies were able to secure the Salerno beachhead. The primary objective of the landings was to secure Naples, about 30 miles up the coast, to ensure the port city's use as a means of supply and to cut across the country to cut off troops further south. By September 16th, the 5th Army was prepared to move up the country to capture Naples, the same day that the British 8th Army linked up with the 5th Army's flank. Since the beginning of the year, Naples had become a frequent target of Allied bombing raids. Only Milan was attacked more frequently. In addition to the port, Naples had rail, industrial, steel, and petroleum facilities, making it an important strategic target. By 1942, Allied strategy had moved away from only strategic bombing to carpet bombing raids that blanketed the city and caused significant civilian casualties, partially in the hope that civilian morale would crater and inspire the locals to revolt. By December of 1942, Naples closed schools and began evacuations, while civilians filled air raid shelters or attempted to construct their own. The last Allied bombing raid occurred on September 8th, hours after the announcement of the armistice. Large numbers of civilians were killed in these attacks. At least 3,000 were killed in a single raid in August of 1943 alone. Tap water, electricity, and gas had all been knocked out by the bombing, as had the sewer system. The dissolution of the Italian army also played a role. In the area, most of the Italian soldiers, confused and without orders, simply abandoned their post. Many of them drifted towards Naples, one of the largest and most important cities in the region. 
The whole of the Campania region had around 5,000 Italian troops, but more than 20,000 Germans. Almost instantly, Italian higher officials in the city abandoned their jobs, either collaborating with Nazi officials or simply fleeing to save their own lives. The Italian soldiers simply blended back into the populace. Both Riccardo Pentamali and Ettore del Teto, generals who held military responsibility in Naples, fled in civilian clothing. Del Teto even officially handed the city over to the Nazis. Several attempts at resistance did bloom within the city throughout several barracks in the 21st Early Detection Post at Castel de Ovo. Local police opened fire on German troops looting stores. On the 20th, Neapolitans obstructed a group of German vehicles and opened fire, killing six. Though those Italians were talked into surrender, the Germans retaliated by burning the National Library and gunning down a crowd that gathered to watch. On the 11th, a group of Germans attacked a hotel, then occupied by a detachment of public security, who fought back and forced the Germans to surrender. With southern Italy actively falling, the German commanders in Naples ordered 4,000 Neapolitans into forced labor. Colonel Walter Scholl, who took command of the German forces in Naples on September 12th, ordered a curfew, declared a state of siege, and demanded all weapons be surrendered immediately. Failure to comply meant death. Scholl also ordered that 100 Italians be killed for every German death in the city. Public executions were held and even filmed in front of crowds being forced to watch. Naples was also known for its scunizzi, young street boys, largely known for being petty thieves and ne'er-do-wells. In the face of violence, however, the scunizzi turned to armed resistance. They broke into an Italian artillery battery on September 22nd and over the next few days stole guns and ammunition elsewhere in the city. While anti-fascist groups were organizing throughout Italy, especially in the north, to act in unison against the Germans, the civilians in Naples were cut off from almost all external forces, and the groups that formed to fight were spontaneous, without significant organization or command. On the 23rd, Colonel Scholl ordered an evacuation of the coast up to 300 yards inland, which would displace nearly a quarter million people and was likely a prelude to the destruction of the city's port. Additionally, compulsory work was called for all men in the city between the ages of 18 and 33. They were to be deported to Germany for use in labor camps. Almost no one followed the orders, and German soldiers rounded up thousands of civilians for deportation. Meanwhile, word leaked to the Neapolitans that Scholl had been ordered to leave the city in cinders and mud. By September 28th, the city had simply had enough. There were no meetings declaring their intentions or leaders organizing their troops. Spurred by tragedy and the brutality of the Nazi occupiers, throughout the city groups of armed citizens, children, soldiers who had deserted, women and the elderly, struck out. Clashes and rioting spread throughout the city against German troops. One resistance fighter later said that we felt completely free and secure. We were armed and we knew who the enemy was. This was a moment of absolute liberty because the state had vanished, both the fascist state and the state of the king. The state was the Germans, who were oppressors and invaders. Small groups of partisans simply attacked, and the attack spread. The Scunizi played an important role, fighting on their own and taunting their elders as the Germans rounded up civilians for deportation or execution. Even children engaged the Germans, not just transporting supplies and messages, but actually fighting. 11-year-old General Capiozzo was dropping grenades on German tanks when he himself was killed. He was later given the gold medal for military valor for his actions. Partisans attacked the Germans where they were holding rounded up prisoners, and many of the civilians meant for deportation were rescued. By the end of September 27th, the partisans had captured the Castel del San Elmo, a medieval fortress. The cramped labyrinth streets were filled with barricades and debris dropped from balconies, which made it difficult for German tanks called in to help suppress the uprising. Several were destroyed by partisans during the fighting. The barriers concealed mines dug up from surrounding minefields, and partisans waited on the rooftops with Molotov cocktails and guns. The governor of a boy's prison in the city armed his charges and released them to help fight the Germans. The partisans prevented the Germans from blowing up a bridge that would have isolated the city center and increasingly made the German position untenable. On top of all this, the Germans did not intend to hold Naples, just to destroy it, and Scholl was under pressure to pull his troops back as the Allied advance neared the city. A young partisan reached Scholl and began negotiating for the release of captured partisans in exchange for allowing the Germans safe passage out of the city. Already, the German evacuation had begun, as rumors that proved to be untrue spread about another Allied landing in the city itself. At a square in the city, a German force with tanks fired upon a large group of rebels, killing 12. The local resistance leaders were unable to make any connections to exterior resistance forces and continued to act only on the orders of local leaders. On September 30th, the fourth day, Antonio Teresa, a school teacher, proclaimed himself head of the rebels and announced his control of the city. Fighting continued throughout the day and German artillery shelled the city. The fleeing Germans continued to kill civilians and set fires, including setting aflame the state archives of Naples. After begging for it to be spared, the director was allowed only to save what he could carry. The Germans also left behind explosives and booby traps and poisoned the city's water supply. 
Several days after the retreat, an explosion at the post office palace was attributed to a German bomb. After days of fighting on the morning of October 1st, British soldiers from the King's Dragoon Guards were the first to reach the city. The Germans had already retreated in front of them, and the Allies found a city already free of serious military resistance. Though considerable damage had been done to the city, the partisans had prevented the wholesale deportation of the population and significantly hindered the German plan to destroy the city. The Italian military commanders who had fled the city were sentenced to 20 years in prison for their actions, though those sentences were later reduced. It is unclear how many were killed during the fighting. Some authors say around 160 rioters and another 160 unarmed civilians were killed, and the post-war commission recognized partisans put the total at 155. A cemetery in Naples puts the number as high as 562. Possibly as many as 100 Germans were killed. After the war, a significant national myth built around the Italian resistance, emphasizing the essential democratic nature of that resistance that would lead to the abolition of the monarchy and the creation of a new government. But while the Four Days of Naples has become well known in Italy and Naples, its spontaneous nature has left a complex legacy. As one Italian historian wrote, history cannot ignore that the rebellion of Naples is incomplete. There were no parties, no politicians, no intellectuals. The rebellion lacked the, the political nature of the anti-fascism that became so important in the post-war scene. It was also of very little military value. Instead, it was a, a popular insurrection built on the backs of a, a suffering people who saved their neighbors and friends while a war beyond their control raged around them. But it was precisely the spontaneity of the resistance that makes these four days so unique. Without guidance or support, in the face of significant violence and hardship, the people of Naples rebelled to save themselves and the city they loved. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the History Guide, short snippets of forgotten history. And if you did enjoy, feed the algorithm by making a comment or clicking that like button. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please send those to our suggestions email box. Check out our webpage at thehistoryguide.net. And of course, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can book a special message from the History Guy on Cameo and check out our merchandise at teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes of Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe.